Welcome to the Prosthetics and Orthotics Podcast with Brent Wright and Joris Peels. Hello everyone, this is Joris Peels with another edition of the Prosthetics and Orthotics Podcast with Brent Wright. Hi Brent, how are you doing? Hey Joris, I'm doing well. Today is a great day. We're going to talk to Arthur Hobden. He is doing a lot of really neat things for cost-effective design in the prosthetic and orthotic field. He has some interesting workflows, and I've had a chance to kind of look behind the curtain on some of those, and I'm really excited for him to kind of share his story because he is not a clinician, but he understands design very well. So I'm really excited to have him here. Okay. Nice. Well, welcome to the show, Arthur. <laughs> Thank you, guys. It's, it's incredible to be here. Okay. And, and, and well, Arthur, tell us a little bit. So uh, what's your background and how did you get involved in this OMP world? Let's say? So I'm an industrial designer by trade. Industrial design is sort of the study of consumer goods and production. So, you know, and sort of integrating that with cultural needs, psychological impact, and, you know, creating the interface between an entrepreneur and, you know, a con- a production. And so there's a, it's sort of like a, an engineer who doesn't get taught with math. Instead, you get, you sort of use art history, design concepts, psychology, and sort of other tools to navigate the same problem of how do I go about fabricating something? So I'm using industrial design. I've been working in 3D printing for the last eight years. I've been in many different industries and sort of freelancing or working for myself as a consultant. So I help Right now, like I'm working for myself with OMP Digital Designer, and I'm also working for a cool outfit called Taika 3D, which is a digital design company that does design automation and design engines for orthotics and prosthetics. What's um, a design so, engine? What's a design? Tell us about that. Yeah, so Taika 3D does design automation, and design automation essentially is you know a program that will create an orthotic from a scan. So all you do is you upload an order form, you upload a 3D scan, and their design engine will create the final product. And this can be a direct mill or a CNC mill or a 3D printed product. And then the clinician or the practitioner just goes in and validates the design and sends it right off to the printer or the mill that's going to be producing it. And um, how much does that a, cost? Because that like automatically, if it works, it seems like it's going to save me a ton of work, right? Yeah, so it really does scale for how much you use it. They have, you know, upfront rates as well as like support rates, but they sort of tout and solve a very acute bottleneck problem inside of ONP right now where, you know, large central fab providers are getting bogged down with current design tools, digital design tools because they don't scale right now with the mass economics of scale or like the production scaling of orthotics because if you need to produce you know 150 to 200 orthotic orthotics a day or pairs of orthotics that really doesn't you can't do that as one person or as a team of two or three like you're going to need like four full-time digital artists using something like fitfoot 360 or delcam working all day uh, non-stop on producing orthotics and that's a really hard thing to to maintain it's a really hard skill set to find it's a you know hard thing to ask of someone with that skill set to do non-stop all the time so it's a it's an amp bottleneck that they have found and they're very good at solving because it essentially you know the analogy for me is at a grocery store you know the automated tellers there's Instead of 10 cashiers for 10 tills, there's one cashier for five tills, and they're sort of monitoring and, and supervising what's going through. And they can then, as a result of the higher throughput, can focus on the people who need help. So you know, some old lady at a store who needs help with her shopping bags or someone who's got a large item they can't scan, you know, that person can then help them. But the vast majority of everyone else can sort of just flow through without any without any resistance. So in a similar way, these sort of design engines help people, digital artists in CFAP facilities, increase their throughput to the point where, you know, they're validating a design that's been made for them every 12 to 15 seconds. And so your throughput goes from maybe 10 pairs an hour, 15 pairs an hour, if you're, you know, a, a very skilled artist to anywhere upward to like 60 pairs an hour or a hundred pairs an hour, if the system's really mature. Yeah, definitely. That sounds really interesting. But, and what do you think of like an industrial designer? Usually uh, it's interesting because we have practitioners, right? 
we've got a lot of people we've had people on the podcast that have been like kind of advocates more or actually kind of users that are kind of engineer their own uh, prosthetics but we haven't had an industrial designer quite yet so what do you think like you know in, in this kind of thing like on the one hand what do you think a role of an industrial designer is in this kind of a thing in or- orthotics and prosthetics what, what do you see the, the the real sweet spot for for this kind of uh, person well, I got into orthotics and prosthetics because of Scott Summit. If you if you remember him back, I love, I Scott. Was, I love Scott. Yeah, He's so he, wonderful. Yeah, so back in twenty, I think it was twenty twelve or twenty thirteen, he did that huge marketing campaign and showed a bunch of his devices and all the beautiful legs he was doing and the the emotional and the psychological recovery of amputees as a result of using emotional and psychological aspects in product design to solve that problem and. I was immediately transfixed, and that was indeed the, the the very point that I decided that you know prosthetics and prosthetics was extremely interesting to me because of what he was doing. I actually wrote a thesis in university for exactly that emotional and psychological recovery of amputees through the use of product design. So that first and foremost is a really cool and powerful thing that industrial design can bring to the table. Another thing about industrial design is that because it's got a much more user-centric emphasis that we can get into the minds of the people we work for much easier and we can facilitate much easier. And so for me, that translates into instruction and training. So, you know, I come Mm -hmm. from a family of teachers. There's a lot of teachers in my family and I really, really, really enjoy teaching myself and, and the, my ability to do that, you know, easily and, you know, fluidly in, in my opinion is because I have that ability to sort of like go past, you know, the technicalities of, you know, how a software works or what the design concepts are and really get into, you know, who the other person is on the other end, who's going to be using this or who the other person is that we're designing for, you know, what's their cultural context, what's the product trying to actually solve for them past, you know, form and function. So it's a, it's a cool skill to have on top. You know, it's a, it's a very often a complementary skill set to an interdisciplinary team of product and like engineers, product developers, and the, you know, industrial design brings a, a really much needed interface between sort of the, the user and the consumer, you know, and as well as communicating that to the consumer as well, when they go to communicate with, with industry. Yeah, uh, because I think it's interesting. Like industrial designers, I think they've got like kind of like I mean, a bunch of my friends are industrial designers or designers. I kind of make fun of them that like they're artists that don't want to be poor. Uh, you know, <laughs> that's kind that's of actually like that. kind of accurate. Uh, <laughs> but but a lot of people kind of have like the like yeah, you know, and even in industry, I've had this like like they like oh let's take it to the industrial designer person who put the pretty sauce over it, you know. The kind of like we've made the okay. thing yeah. <laughs> now we're going to pitch it over to the person they're going to make it all super cute you know yeah and i think uh and, and it just happens to be that that the one of the books holding up my laptop is the design of everyday things by uh norman something other doll norman mm-hmm. and uh and and so i thought I, i've read uh, extensively on the subject and, and and he's one of the guys behind this whole user-centric design movement or user-centered design I think, but I think you know this also implies that you're brought in in the beginning of this this new product, right? But also, you know, the very origin of it, rather than being called in kind of as after a, the fact, exactly yeah, after. And, and can you talk to us about a little bit about making a user centered thing? Because I think really for prosthetics and stuff, this is so important. And often, I don't know, it just looks like it's so unusable. It just looks like it's so like it just it's not intuitive. And a lot of these things are just like, okay, these people kind of like learn to deal with it because they have to because they use it every day. But if you just like confronted these objects first, they just look so not warm, they don't look elegant, they don't look human. And they don't look really, really like intuitive at all. So yeah, yeah, especially this compared to like, all the other stuff in my life, which a lot of it is really well designed, whether it's like a cheap disposable razor or a headphone. And then all of a sudden, there's these things that people rely on, and they're not well designed at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like you can easily see the ethos behind any product you've put in your hand or anything ever designed or manipulated by man. It could even be like something as simple as, you know, a store, a stone formation on the side of the river. Like you can see the intent behind it. And you're right. Prosthetics for the longest time have been purely about function. You know, there's a very much an, an engineering you know, functionality first model where, you know, and and industrial design might be brought in after the fact. For me, the most success for industrial design comes when you actually implement it first before the engineering comes in. Because if you 
interrogate the user or the consumer with industrial design. The industrial designer will very often come up with a product that the original scope didn't at all account for. And that was just because they spent the time to figure out who the person was and what their interests were, or like, what really is the problem? And finding out a bunch of things around that, and then taking that into a concept where, okay, well, the design probably should look like this and have these added elements for these reasons, because this is the consumer we're building for. And then they can take that to production. And then production has, you know, it we appreciates someone like a designer who can speak their language. You know, they can, you can give them CAD friendly outputs. You can talk to them and understand how sheet metal works or how injection molding works. Like you, you know, these things as much as you know about the consumer on the other end. So you're, you're bridging that gap. And then the, the engineers have a much, much clearer picture, you know, from zero point of where they're going and why they need to go there. So, you know, for me, the interface between the user and the product is most most effectively leveraged when industrial design comes first and engineering sort of builds off of that work that they do with the consumer, or in this case, the patient. And and with orthotics and prosthetics, you can really get up and close to the user. But I think that the, the really exciting thing about industrial design also is that you kind of translate the needs of the, the company and the user and kind of bring them all together in one object, right? Exactly. It's exactly right. Industrial design for me has been so interesting and like it really spoke to me because I'm actually really interested in design as a whole, just as a, as a genre and design software as well is something that just really attracted my eye. So like when I was really young, <laughs> another key momentous moment in my life was when my bro- my father came home when I was about 14 with a big blue lights, blue bin special box from shoppers drug mart. You know, he got a copy of Maya six and a huge manual on how to use Maya six. And then he, an Intuos touch pen tablet. And with that, I spent, you know, a full summer learning how to 3d model and, and creating animations and stuff. Alicia learned with something like super easy, like Maya. (laughs) (laughs) Maya. (laughs) Right. Oh my God. Maya is not, yeah, it's not a, it was especially back then. Like that, that was not an easy program to learn. So, so that probably sort of set the stage for later on when I got into school and just my 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 fascination with design software. And so like yeah, design for me is really a potent, potent tool and it's it's arguably more powerful than you know production and out and input. So like in the sphere of O and P, you know, um, good design is 10 times more powerful than, you know, the best scanner and the best printer. If you, you know, if you can't leverage a good scanner and, you know, make up for the fact that you don't know how to get to a 3D printer through design. And similarly, you can't have a giant crazy printer like an HP 580 and expect to leverage that price point as a result of your lack of design. And so like design really is that thing between all of spheres in ONP, which is undervalued right now and is not being talked about enough and is really one of the most powerful tools that is to, you know, that, that is updating the tool chest essentially of ONP practitioners right now and probably has been since like for the last 70 years, I'd say this is, you know, we're on the cusp of a digital transformation and the tools that are coming in are really going to be game changing and it's exciting to, to be a part of it. And, you know, as a result of my work with uh, ONP Digital Designer, where, you know, I'm creating um, software tutorial series on how to use, you know, agnostic CAD or affordable 3D print, uh, 3D modeling softwares for printing, as well as with my work with Taika, which is a really like a tier three, like a really high tier sort of software package for high industry in um, orthotics and prosthetics, you know, I've got, I've got a front row seat right now to what's happening in digital design and ONP, which is really exciting. What would you say is the, the number one kind of trend that you're seeing as far as the attitude towards not only design, but this idea of 3d printing and really these digital orthoses are, is it a, is it an easy sell? Is it hard or what, what are these barriers to entry that people may or may not know that they're putting up or taking down to really digitize their practice? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So I, yeah, I spent a year and a half researching this exact thing before I started writing the course material that I'm putting out. So like the OMP market is incredibly interesting to me because of how different it is compared to the rest of the digital design industry. So, you know, I'm comparing OMP software right now to, you know, automotive, machining, engineering, product development, dental, even, you know, all of these areas, which are very mature and have, who have been leveraging 3D printing very effectively for a while, you know, I've worked in or at least sampled in all of them uh, through my time. And the reason why the, the market is so different in ONP is, is the software that's being touted as a solution is, well, first and foremost, it's 10 times more expensive than any other industry would ever be willing to pay for. And no one in ONP seems to know about this or talk about this. And that's a huge barrier that doesn't need to be there, you know, and it's arguably one of the most powerful tools that gets you 80% of the way there should you decide to remove it. You know, ONP software, in my view, is a double-edged sword. You know, it's, it's curated and meant for beginners with no digital skills. So the software provider, you know, prepares the software, assumes the risk, dumbs down the needed skill in, in essence to get to a final product, and then manages your production chain, right? And, and all this in exchange for, you know, their, their price rate. So um, because it's 10 times, 10 times higher, it's, it's a barrier that first and foremost can easily be removed by deciding to instead take ownership of your own design journey and instead looking out to what other players in design are doing right now in, in you know, other industries. So design can be and should be talked about as you know something that is the most important thing that practitioners can do today to get their practice into the digital space so my- but, okay but then there's two kind of entry paths and i think it's interesting that you kind of represent both of them like one is i can take two thousand hours or whatever learn cad and become the expert and mm-hmm. i can design the best prosthetics like and, and be on the cutting edge the other thing is I could like rely on a tool that doesn't allow me to be the expert, but I can use all this digital whiz bang stuff. Maybe I'm not on the cutting edge, but it's easy and I don't have to take the 2000 hours. Like, like is that for a different person? Is it for a different practitioner or different practice? Well, you know, those are the two paths or the, the third path is I don't do anything. Right. I don't, I ignore yeah. this kind of thing at all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there is like through my research, the landscape sort of has three major tiers and your journey through OMP 3D printing will eventually travel through all of them as, as a rate of like how long you spend. So, you know, tier one is like getting your, your hands dirty, getting into the game and starting to learn about 3D printing. So, you know, buying a, a 3D printer at home and starting to play with materials, learning about the process, learning about, you know, doing simple 3D modeling and, and getting your hands dirty and then moving into, you know, well, how do I immediately apply this to my practice? And, uh, you know, maybe you get into looking at bigger machines, but really that doesn't come until, you know, a, a sort of a tier two phase where you've been using th- digital design for like, you know, five to seven years, at least this is my journey. So like you've been using design and leveraging good design for a long time and you, you don't need, you know, a good scanner and you don't need a good 3d printer to be an active player in the space. So like, you know, to give you an example, like, you know, I've been working for eight years in 3d printing. I've never once owned a printer that cost me more than $200. And, you know, I've, I'm putting out several devices a week and I'm working with comb scanners. I used to sell you know, Creaform scanners. I've worked with peel and Einscan scan scanners. I, I teach people how to use them. You know, all of these, you know, the input and outputs of 3d printing steps one and three are really irre- superfluous, irrelevant. They will sort themselves out and indeed they, they have but the step in between is the part that makes, you know, tier one, your, your, of your journey that's what makes you so competent and makes makes you a, a you know a quick contributing player in the space you really start to get into exploring your inputs and outputs when you sort of have been around for a while and uh, your your clinic is expanding or you have a uh, large floor space and you're increasing your throughput and there's more clinicians in in in, the, in your area uh, sorry in your in your practice and you know you need those machines now and you're starting to look into four machines and you're starting to look into you know how do we standardize our scanning techniques and what kind of jigs do we get and you know that's a whole other tier of, of you know your journey in in digital design and then even then when you scale and refine that and and, and uh 
promote your own efficiency as you go, you know, by the time you get to tier three, which is like a really mature stage in, you know, 3D printing or, or even just production. So, you know, CFAB facilities in ONP, I, I would consider sort of a tier three player in the sense that, you know, they, they're managing almost a whole factory at this point where they've got, you know, huge lines of people, um, you know, producing 150 orthotic devices a day, or they're, you know, they're a central fab and taking orders from a great many people through an app from a scanner. You know, they really need to get their efficiency down. They really need to prevent themselves from getting bottlenecks in the the process of creating and shipping out these products. And so, you know, Taika 3D, for example, is that third tier where, you know, they're actually going in and pr- introducing mass automation and, uh, you know, factory floor c- consolidation into a single platform. And so, you know, you don't start with that if you want to get into 3D printing. And I would also argue you certainly don't start with buying a large printer. Uh, you know, that should be something very far down the line for anyone who wants to get into the space today. Um, but like for small to medium sized mom and pop shops, you know, the, the one thing you can do that gets you into the game 10 times quicker and 10 times cheaper is to, uh, you know, become familiar with agnostic CAD packages and, uh, you know, start leveraging good design, uh, to, to, you know, get into the industry today, as opposed to waiting until, you know, when you have the opportunity to get a printer or, or something like this, which I don't think is ever needed. I'm so glad you said that because there's so many people like well, I think the small to medium business they know all of a sudden oh wait this thing's three hundred grand oh wait you know, um, but 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 bigger businesses or medium like uh like like cash rich businesses have the 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 kind of the the idea that they would get everything will be faster as long as they buy the machine really quickly, and it just puts this thing on their balance sheet it's 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 sitting there it may not be the right one for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they probably can't fill it, so it's going to be super inefficient in the in the beginning. So I'm so glad you said that. that like, don't start with the expensive machine, even if you can afford it. I think that's a really good point. Yeah. Um, and I really like the idea of just starting with a desktop machine, just to understand what you're doing and understand a lot of the things. Um, you know, do you have advice on technology? Would you always just say like start with FDM because it's accessible? Say if you could do it for two hundred bucks and 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 and, is, and you can make useful devices or. I mean, in my in my experience, as you know, Derek Schmidt with Lemon Lattice, he he's done amazing work with a Sidewinder. Like he's done the deep dive, he really has. And you know, I, I point some people I work with to his content all the time because it's like, look, this isn't my specialty, but I know someone who does. So like FDM does have you know, I don't think anyone in ONP has plumbed the true depth of what FDM can offer. But in terms of what I would recommend for you know what for printers and for technology, you know, start with comb scanners because they're free, you know, that's great, but do educate yourself around the idea that they are very poor in quality and um, they are very hard to, to sort of rein in and handle. So your inputs, you know, if you can get a scanner, you know, there's a new one coming out called Einstar, which I'm really excited about. It looks like, you know, a sub thousand dollar scanner, which with an amazing input, you know, I used to sell 3D scanners at a 3D printer reseller network in Canada here. And, you know, a scanner of that quality five years ago would have been $30,000, $15,000 even. So, you know, the fact that the inputs and the technology around 3D scanning is coming down that quickly, like to me the technology behind 3d scanning has been solved. Like it's being democratized and it's going to be standardized very, very soon. The output question though, in terms of 3d printers is one where, you know, I don't think you should trust FDM for devices when you're starting out, you know, FDM is a great tool to learn on. It's a great thing to have at home. You can certainly print out and test, you know, check sockets and what have you, but it's, it's risky to use FDM prints on end use patients. Um, in my opinion, I just, I try to avoid it. HP and MJF, tw- you know, MJF nylon is the chosen medium right now in ONP and with good reason, you know, it's, it's isotropic material. It's very stable and solid. And the other th- thing about MJF is that there's a huge reseller network and there's a huge service bureau network online right now there's a ton of people who own MJF machines who are very eager to find business because the profit models of HP machines involve keeping the machines busy, filling up the trays, putting throughput, making parts and shipping up parts. Like there's a lot of people out there right now who will be happy to print for you. And that's the great thing about good design is that, you know, I can approach any vendor and say, Hey, I've got a bunch of medical devices. I need you to print. Here's the files. Here's the documentation. This is my background. This is the clinic I'm representing. 
can you give me, you know, these different materials? And I'm rattling off a bunch of different properties. You know, they're going to turn around and, and be very eager to work with me and very eager to, you know, find a, find a solution because, um, you know, I'm ready for business and their, their, their profit model is good to go. However, if you are an OMP technician or something, if you're an OMP and you're like, Hey, I want to design medical, I want to produce medical devices. What can you do for me? And, you know, can you design it for me? Can you work with these scans I made with my iPhone? You know, you're going to get crickets and, you know, it's because there's a ton of risk obviously associated with designing medical devices in a, in a medium that they're not used to. Like if you're looking to get into 3d printing, don't try and get a printer because chances are there's someone out there who has a printer. And indeed there are many people who have printers out there who will print for you. So leverage them and you can eagerly get their business by having and showing that you understand design and you've done good design for them because they are, they're happy to print for you all day as a result of this. That's a good point. I would say exactly the same thing and just, just get other people to do it. From a business standpoint, you know, making money in the manufacturing is very difficult. It depends on having the right volume, like you said, at the right scale, the right cost structure. And it's a very, very tough business. Yeah. Just designing it and then having it made by somebody else is a much better business in terms of capex yeah. and all this stuff. So, yeah. Totally. Well, I mean, I, 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 yeah. I've been on sales meetings with certain clients of mine from the past and like we went straight to HP, didn't, went to their sales manager, talked to their teams, you know, what does it cost? What is it? Well, why do I want to bring this machine in? Should we buy this? And, you know, the honest answer from, you know, head of production, I've heard several times, and it's a really easy number to remember, $10,000. If you are outsourcing $10,000 a month in MJF prints and paying consumer rates for those devices, and you do that consistently for two to three to four months, you're at the stage where you can afford to bring an MJF printer in-house. And you're at the stage where it's actually going to be more profitable for you to bring it in-house and to hire the technician and to buy the consumable materials and to, you know, get the floor, the floor space and, and create the temperature and, and, you know, the extra heating and electricity and all that. Like there's a lot of stuff that goes into those machines. And uh, yeah, if that's the magic number, and if everyone's going to sit around waiting until they have a need for $10,000 of 3D printing per month, then nothing's ever going to happen, right? You know, you don't get there by buying an FDM printer and a scanner, but then asking SaaS software to, to do the design for you because it's in the way, right? You get there by becoming very potent in digital design and spending years perfecting digital design as a part of your tool chest to the point where you're producing lots and lots of devices quickly and easily and you have a network and then you know then you get to that point right so there's a lot of work that gets there and people don't realize that i think it's i think it's neat that you you suggest like <clears throat> working with the people that want to work with you, right? You've probably had some conversations where they're like, eh, we've thought about O&P, but it's not something that we're comfortable with or what have you. In the same note, I don't know if you've done any testing like contract manufacturer to contract manufacturer, but I know like even in, in the space that we're at, because we do outsource some things, we can send the file to two different places and get two different results. And I think mm-hmm. that's pretty amazing in the same sense of what you were saying about, Hey, you got to be careful of validating your scanner and all that. I think you also have to work with whoever that provider is of your devices to make sure that the inputs are equaling the outputs and how are they going to guarantee that as well as the quality. This is, is one thing too, with these contract manufacturers, and you mentioned it very well, is that the way that you make money is not only volume, but pushing out as many parts as possible. And with that, a lot of contract manufacturers will allow their powder to degrade. They'll pack at extremely high densities. And while the parts may look flipping amazing, they will fail. Mm -hmm. And so those are all questions also that you have to talk to these uh, contract manufacturers with is, Hey, what are you doing as far as your density? How, what's your refresh rate? What are you doing as far as the color of the powder? Where are my pieces going to be in the build? What is the orientation? Are you going to compromise the orientation of one of my parts for, for your profit? And those are all discussions and they're hard discussions to have. But I know like for me as a contract manufacturer that we're not out there, but we do other work for East Point. 
those are all questions that I would love to answer. And those are the type of people that I want to work with because they know what they're talking about. Right. And so I think you being in the middle of a lot of those discussions is super valuable and will save clinicians a lot of pain. Say if something does fail, you can actually take a look back and dive into data and say, hey, this potentially is the problem. You you can look at the orientation of the part or whatever, and then maybe bring it back to the design. But I would say good design is is what's what's going to win every single time exactly that yeah and so like to your point one of the first things i look for in a contract manufacturer is are they iso certified because there's a lot of standards around that that they have to follow and they have to follow fastidiously in order to attain clients like the canadian government or the u.s military or big pharma like there's you know, if you're ISO certified, you hold yourself to a certain standard where your materials are traceable and your and your processes are standardized. So, you know, there's definitely people out there who aren't that. But if you find that, you're you're going to be in a good space. And you know, all those questions, you're like, you know, build density. You know, what's your orientation? Where are these parts? How long is the lead time? You know, you you ask these things up front, bef- you know, in your initial email order as you're going around shopping for different vendors like you're going to get a very high quality response because these people really do want to work with you they will not respond and very often will just you know just completely ignore people who are like hey i want this printed here's my napkin sketch i don't understand design can you send me you know can you give me a phone call at my office right it's like it's a totally different conversation to have if you if you can leverage good design or just understanding the digital design market right yeah. So well, and I think like that's also a really good point because I think in the same sense of the contract manufacturers, they don't know our space at all. No, and they don't want to. <laughs> well, and they don't want to, but they are willing to a lot of them are willing to take parts that are poorly designed and print them and they don't know that they're poorly designed. And so then then who takes the fall if it fails? And I think that's where having somebody that knows design, like what you're doing and such. So those contract manufacturers can be confident that what they're doing and printing is, is going to be correct. Cause I have seen plenty of things. And even in trade shows, it's like, man, I, there, I don't know that I would be doing it that way. So I, my encouragement to contract manufacturers is don't just print it because you can make some money. I would ask a few follow-up questions as well of who I'm getting stuff from. Um, What are you doing to make sure this is safe for your patient? You know, what, what is important to you? Those sorts of things, because these margins are so slim for these contract manufacturers. If something fails and they have to reprint for whatever reason, which is also a discussion that you need to have up front, they're going to be in the hole significantly because they're they're fighting these real thin margins. So those are all things to think about as well, wouldn't you say? Yeah, you know, absolutely. Their, their, their cost model and profit model indeed doesn't account for any of the risk associated with O&P. And you have to, to leverage that. And so by taking on, so like I, I keep saying design, 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 I'm sure that can be a pretty ambiguous term, right? So like good design in specific to the OMP field to me uh, is CAD literacy. It's, it's digital design literacy. It's being able to use digital design tools, you know, pick a platform, stick with it and being able to communicate and clearly with industry and using industry standards. And so, you know, if you have a, you know, if you have a bad scan and or a really good scan and you email that to a designer, there's very little difference between the workflows of getting a bad scan to a product versus getting a really highly accurate scan to a product, right? And then similarly with printing, it doesn't necessarily matter who or where you're printing with, you know, it's going to be taken care of by other people in this case, because you can leverage, you know, decent CAD literacy and CAD design for them. And so the only thing left then is to to make sure that you understand that CAD design software is, you know, one of the biggest 
tool chest, you know, tool chest expansions <laughs> for ONP right now. And by taking that one step, you can really, you know, jump into the game so much quicker because this means you don't need to have an expensive scanner. This means you don't need to have a 3D printer. This means that, you know, you can spend weekends and evenings on a computer learning a software that, you know, you, you picked and you consider fun and, and easy to use and, uh, you know, getting into the game online using online sourcing. So like it, it, it's, it's a, once you remove the conception that getting into 3d printing involves, you know, $500,000 in some cases of like uptake in, in the initial costs and two years of training and all these different software packages. Once you remove that and you say to the person, no, the one thing you can do is going to cost you maybe a thousand dollars a year. And it's going to be something you can do on the weekends over your computer. And that is learning design. You know, the, the conversation of facilitating small mom and pop shop, a 3d printing adoption just immediately becomes more accessible and i don't think people necessarily in onp are, are getting that that message right now um so like and i love i love that i mean design literacy is i mean you need to trademark that term or something i, I or i should google it and see what <laughs> well <laughs> using it yeah that's a, Digital that's design amazing. literacy. And yeah. So that that's what my website and my my sort of side venture is all about. So ONP Digital Designer teaches design literacy. And the there's like two major aspects to that message. One is that by taking on digital design literacy using agnostic traditional CAD, you can reduce the upfront software costs by 90%. And that's not a joke. You can literally compete with like any ONP specific software right now in the market today using Agnostic CAD, and it costs you maybe a thousand dollars a year. So you know, Spentees, Rodin 4D, you know, a lot of these packages that we're all familiar with, you know, the monthly fee for them is something like four hundred and fifty dollars a month, or it's by per pair or it's by device or you know it's a monthly rate of several hundred dollars and they take half your l code reimbursement as a result of producing the fabrication for you so these softwares you know they curate they do a bunch of things for you but at the end of the day it's actually a skill drain and it's actually i'm gonna be a little radical i'm gonna, I'm gonna say it's actually kind of dangerous for where o p is going and like it, it really needs to be addressed. So like, so right now in ONP software, the idea of no CAD skills software, the the idea that you know design is the thing that's in the way of me doing my job. I need to take a scan and I want a product. I want to go from inputs to outputs. I want to get past this roadblock of design. I want something that's no CAD skills to do this for me. That's really dangerous because A, as we've discussed, design is the most important and most effective and most powerful tool that you've been given in the last 70 years to update your tool chest. B, it's also the thing that's going to make you most clinically relevant in the next 10 years as the digital transformation continues. And, you know, there's no stopping it. And so by treating it like this, by essentially not giving it its due, you're creating an environment where you're, you're putting in, you know, putting insurance third-party payer providers in bed with the production network, with the software provider, uh, and putting them all together, and then separating yourself from them with an app in between you. So the practitioner removes himself from ownership of the production chain, removes himself from the design that produces it, and then the digital order form and the order entry that he's required to do to participate is, you know, through market feedback or through their own messaging. I'm not too sure which one is which, but, you know, constantly they're asking for something that's easy to use and doesn't require a lot of skill. And so you you, you take that to its logical conclusion. You, you, you go through several generations of that where you're, you're, you're making things simpler and simpler and you're, you're consolidating these huge parts of your industry into one conglomerate company behind an app. You, you get to the point where the, the app and those companies are just going to almost circumvent the practitioner because the practitioner's role becomes less and less, less and less, not relevant, but like, you know, throw in some AI machine learning, throw in some automated design and throw in really nice order forms, digital order forms. And, you know, you can go direct to patient 
you could have an insurance payer just sort of pass on a referral through a telemarketer or telehealth marketer, you know, go and upload your, your information and take a picture. Maybe, maybe there's an, there's a scanner technician who scans the patient, but you're really at risk of removing yourself from this process altogether and, you know, not enabling yourself to attain these skills that are going to be needed in the next 10 years through design, for example, to, to, to be an active participant. Yeah, we, we came to, in a previous episode, we came to a similar kind of conclusion that, it's not exactly what you're saying, but it's very similar. The, the idea being that if I'm a chain and I do all my own fabrication and I do all the engineering work through automated tools, then I just need a bunch of people to see a lot of patients. So that would mean that 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 it would be ripe for kind of a McDonald's of McDonald's of vacation. That's exactly right. That's exactly <laughs> um, right. So, uh, and then and then you would just go to somebody who's a more efficient operator would see not you know three patients a day, but but ten or fifteen or whatever, and just automate that process through scanning, have the things made maybe even in a different country, and then have them shipped uh, uh, next week or something like that. Okay. So that, I, I do understand like, a little bit of a different angle, but it's it's the same kind of idea that. Yes, it's powerful and it saves time, but it also helps you commoditize your business. Yours, I think the other thing that's interesting that Arthur brought up, <clears throat> and we don't touch on it probably enough, is this idea of how to save money. Clinicians are always looking for ways to save money, business owners. But this idea of becoming digitally literate is the only way that you can significantly save money in your practice right now. Right now, you've got these, and he mentioned it, L-codes, cost-cutting, and that sort of thing. And, and this is, and Arthur, you probably will agree, at least that's what I was hearing, is I do not understand when I call somebody and say, hey, what kind of pricing are, are you going to give me on that? And they're going to say, well, what are you going to get reimbursed? And then they'd be like, hey, we'll split the difference. Like nothing else works that way in the world. Just tell me what the cost is going to be. And this is where I really appreciate Arthur talking about, you know, talk to multiple contract manufacturers, because I think what you'll find is you can actually get into the game at a very competitive rate, at, at minimum, a lateral move as far as cost goes to other contract manufacturers or traditional manufacturing, and potentially you start saving money. But this idea of you're going to pay me as a function of what I'm going to get reimbursed is crazy. <laughs> I actually had this discussion with in our office, you know, the device that they were asking to be designed was very complex, but it was small. And so they asked, well, is it going to be you know, less than a transtibial because it's smaller. And I'm like, I'm going to have three times more design work and it's going to be more expensive. <laughs> yeah. You know, it has nothing to do with how much it actually costs to print. It's what are the inputs that it takes to get that result. Yeah, exactly. And unfortunately in the U S you know, the, 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 the model for, for care is really run rampant with, you know, profiteering as one of the mainstays of how business is done. And so by taking that logical step, like we had said, where you're putting a lot of these automations and these big companies and these networks of providers and networks of manufacturers together and having them generate some sort of outcome for you at, at and, you know, they're at 10 times the cost of what you should pay. Not only are you robbing yourself of a skill set that arguably is transferable into every other industry, should you choose to move around. It's also one of the most amazing hobby level skills that you'll ever have. In my personal opinion, you wouldn't believe the kind of gifts I can make <laughs> for friends and family, right? Like the, these are, these aren't things that are going to end with O and P applications, right? You're robbing yourself of that opportunity of running these things. And instead you're, you're subscribing to someone else's business model, someone else's game. You're giving profit to someone else as opposed to investing in your own skills, you know, invest in your skills over buying machines, invest in your skills and your knowledge set over having to, you know, a, 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 an SAS software that will charge you $450 a month per device or per device type. You know, you've got to subscribe to two or three different outfits. If you want to go completely digital, you'll need a solution in orthotics. You'll need a solution in sockets. You'll need a solution in AFOs. All of those are different SAS subscriptions. 
each of them several hundred dollars a year or seven hundred dollars sorry a month so you know rack that up get a packer get a printer involved get a scanner involved like you're looking at 40 50 60 thousand dollars a month on the high end of software costs and and production costs i'm Choosing, gonna, I'm yeah, gonna be the yeah. devil's advocate here I, I do agree with you kind of, but 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 I, I myself have kind of uh, have not taken a deep dive into CAD because I always thought that we're on the cusp of solving CAD, if you will, right? I've seen a lot of software go from, like, for example, JavaScript being able to do the magical things to people using declarative type methods or even like an IDE, like a little kind of drag and drop type of tool to kind of make it like kind of like really easy to do the magical things that these people are doing only marginally more magical in JavaScript with much more knowledge. So you know, isn't there a risk that I learned all this CAD stuff and then all of a sudden everybody raises the abstraction level and, and CAD becomes completely unnecessary? You don't think that's the case? No, I'm, I'm so yes to all of those things. Those exist and those will be a part of your journey. You don't start there. No one starts there. You, you start with CAD and by establishing that as step one, you really open the door for a lot more people who are in that same spot. We're like, well, look at all of these things that are much higher than my pay rate or my, my ability to learn. How am I ever going to get into it? I just won't, you know, those come in time. So, you know, I've been in 3d printing for eight years. I've been a digital remote designer for all of it. And, you know, I am now just at eight years into my career, getting into sort of the intermediary stages of learning about design automation and using time-saving automation. And so like that was a journey that took me a long time and I will be getting and have been getting into exactly these tools that you're describing, but that should not prevent anyone from getting into the game today using step one through eight, which is using learning digital skill sets. I think that also the other interesting part of this idea of design automation and such is you can't forget the data that you're actually giving the company that provides the design automation. That truly actually becomes the asset long term for machine learning. And so that uh, to me that just in in some ways blows my mind like it's the people that have the most models and the most rectified models are going to be able to create algorithms that help with this machine learning. And that's the true asset. And the people that are paying for these subscriptions and what have you are, are happily giving that away, you know, and it's kind of, it's like the Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff. You know, if it's free, you are the product. Well, the $450 a month, what have you is, is a cost effective way to go. But remember that, you know, anytime that you're involved with any of that and it up- involves the cloud or whatever, your, your data shapes are now becoming this asset that is growing with these other companies. Yeah. And so like, for example, I can use CAD. So, so Fusion 360 and ZBrush are my two chosen softwares. I absolutely love this Fusion 360. I don't like Autodesk as a company, but their products are incredible and I can't help myself. So um, <laughs> Fusion 360 is like, you know, an entry level agnostic CAD. It's a very potent CAD package. It's, I, I would argue, way better than SolidWorks and it's a much more popular platform than Inventor even. And so this is a an entry level CAD system that does allow you to create design automation and to and to to learn the fundamentals of design automation so for example you know creating a design like a like a cosmesis cover let's say and you create a series of sketches and you're revolving and you're creating lofts and you're adding features and you know all these agnostic commands you're, you're plugging in to create a product well if you've done it right this program will actually let you design a product using not static dimensions so you know 250 millimeters high and the diameter here is x and y you can actually use equations and so the the height of the the device is a determining is a determining percentage of the height of the knee for example so you know, X times 0.76 or something. And so you can, and then this dimension can be programmed to affect another dimension so that if you change one, the other one repopulates. 
and you can start to you know think about think in these terms and 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 actually write these rules for yourself using something as simple as fusion so at the end of the day yeah yes you've made a template file for yourself that probably took you 16 hours to produce but the next time you use it it's going to be eight hours and the next time you use it again it's going to be two hours and then by the time you've polished it several times and you have those five key dimensions you always work with called out as a b c and d and you have your sketch network in fusion 360 mapped to a b c d and e as an equation series you can create a template in fusion that runs a fully customized product ready for printing in under two minutes and, you know, yes, this is the analog. This is the hard way, the long way of doing it in the software world. If you don't know scripting, if you don't know these automation tools, these high end automation tools, but I understand automation and macros and algorithms because of my time spent in Fusion 360 doing it this way. And indeed, any of the professionals who are in this space started there too. So that power of these agnostic CAD packages like really fundamentally not only gives you an added skill, but it teaches you fundamentals and ways of thinking in 3D design that are going to be integral to your journey through it as you advance and mature into these larger tools that we were talking about. And explain a little bit, because I think this is a really powerful reason to reuse 360, but but what are some other reasons why 360? I mean, you you, you think it's better than SolidWorks. Why do you believe it's better than SolidWorks, for example? Yeah, so I, I I have a video on YouTube about a half hour deep dive into comparing all agnostic CAD with ONP criteria in mind. So there's a big deep dive on this if anyone's interested in going and finding that. But in a nutshell, SolidWorks is not a good choice for ONP for several reasons. One, they do not have as part of the standard base package any form of spline or anatomical modeling. Last I checked anyway, that they, they don't do organic modeling very well. They also do not allow you to interact with or work with meshes. So, you know, you have to seriously prepare a mesh to get into SOLIDWORKS. You have to reduce it down to less than 10,000 faces. And even if you do get it in, there's no alignment tools and there's no way for you to uh, modify it and there's no way for you to interact with it. So even taking things like a dimension or a line or, or a point off of a surface, you just can't do it. it it's a ghosted image. So. Both of those things right there really make it poor for ONP because we need scan outputs. We need to work with meshes. We need to be able to interface with meshes. And we also need organic surfacing. And so Fusion 360 also costs 25% of what the base rate of SOLIDWORKS costs. And it does both of those things really, really, really well. Also, too, and, like and the, the, the SOLIDWORKS pricing model, too, is nefarious. I do not like how SOLIDWORKS prices their, their software. And like I would highly urge anyone who's not totally invested in SOLIDWORKS already to, to avoid it for that reason. The, the pricing structure is obscene. Could you, could you talk a little bit about that? Could be, a lot of people don't understand. They think it's all like, you know... <laughs> You pay a month, pay an amount a month, amount per month, that kind of thing. How does it work? Okay, yeah. So aside from the technical failures that I've just described, the pricing model. So I believe SolidWorks costs about four grand a year US. It's something around there. And then there's modules of added complexity that you can buy on top of that for another two or three grand. The problem with this is on top of being rather expensive is that should you buy SolidWorks 2017 and you're happily using it for four years and you've been, you know, you've got a workflow, all of a sudden you're like, okay, I need to upgrade to SolidWorks 2022 because my vendor network is upgraded to 2022 and I'm, I can't open their files anymore. You know, there's, I can't open these files they're sending me and I can't interact with my vendors anymore. I need SolidWorks 2022. You go to them and you say, Hey, I want to buy a new license. They find out that you've been using SolidWorks 2017 for four years or for five years. They're going to make you back pay five years worth of installments before they will release 2022 to you. So you have to pay. Yeah. Like it's ridiculous okay. <laughs> so, to me. Yeah. No one else does that. You know, if you buy Rhino five, like there was, there was nine years between releases of Rhino five and Rhino six, like an obscene number. And that was because Rhino as a product, as it was released was super stable and uh, full of features and, it, and it, it lasted a long time. Right. So you get what you pay for. And so, you know, compare that, thousand dollar price tag to these yearly updates which provide arguably like you know the difference between SOLIDWORKS 2017 and 2018 
and the difference between 2018 and 2019 is marginal. Like there might be one or two new things here or there, but it's certainly not worth rebuying the program every year. And it's certainly not worth waiting five years until there's enough features for you to justify buying it to have to go back and then be, you know, be charged $12,000 for all the years you missed. So in that sense, I, I avoid SolidWorks for that reason. Okay. And then another thing I think is a much more exotic choice. I think you, you mentioned that you like ZBrush, which I, I know that people 3D print from it, but usually they come from kind of like they, they make the most beautiful orc in the world and then they, 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 go, they go to 3D printing. So why is ZBrush? Why do you like ZBrush? So ZBrush has been in the market for a really long time and they have been in the mesh market for a really long time. The mesh works like so mesh file types and the mesh genre of of digital design has always been reserved for you know video games, character design, VFX because you know meshes really lend themselves well to to that to that market. And so when we get into three D scanning and we want to prepare and process meshes for CAD, the tools that do that for you are need to be really really well polished and, and really refined. And so ZBrush has, bar none, some of the best algorithms out there for being able to work with high density meshes, the ability to remesh meshes into quad meshes, which is a you know a secret sauce for interfacing mesh workspaces with CAD workspaces. You know, being able to convert a triangular mesh into a quad mesh is is the secret. So Z, ZBrush does that extremely well, and I, you know, that that is one of the only reasons why ZBrush and Fusion 360 go together so well is because ZBrush creates outputs in quad meshing that is so friendly to, to Fusion, so friendly to CAD. And, you know, I, I went extensively on a, on a feature hunt through different softwares. Like I tried Blender, I tried Maya, I tried Alias, I tried a ton of, you know, free open standalone softwares looking for something that could quad mesh to the level of fidelity that ZBrush could do, and no one can do it. Um, ZBrush just has a power to it that nobody can quite match. And they've been an industry outlier for a long time. They've been doing things their own way. They don't follow conventions. They don't even, you know, lo like loading a file or saving a file are fundamentally different. They're not even called files in the program. Like they just do things differently. But as a result of this, their the power you have in those suites is, is some of the most, <laughs> some of the best that in the industry bar none. And so I, I purport ZBrush because not only is it a great mesh editor, but it has a bunch of added tools as a result of this industry it comes from that can take a CAD design and take it to the next level, like an order of magnitude more complex and more cool and more. So, you know, um, you, you had Brent, you had your, your coworker Tyler on before this, and, you know, he came from cosplay and looking for exactly that kind of modeling. ZBrush does that modeling extremely, extremely well and doing that added complexity or organic sculpting or full color texturing or lattice designing or picture stamping, you know, these tools that I've seen high industry try and replicate so like materialized mimics or, or magics, for example, has modules that are $30,000 to allow someone to take a, a 2d image of carbon fiber or an alpha of a neural texture and apply it to a mesh. It'll take them 22 minutes to process. It'll take a very long time. And you know, your computer might die in between, but that's the price point of a comparable software right now in high industry that attempts to do what ZBrush can do instantly over a brush setting. And then ZBrush is also like 30 bucks a month. It's, it's a very affordable software. Well, and I think, I mean, it's perfect to dive into what you offer, but I was able to take a look at some of the programs that you've done, not only in Fusion 360, but then I was super interested. How are you creating some of the textures and such in ZBrush? And with if I was wanting to get into that, that would definitely be a way that I want to go. And I think it's <clears throat> probably a way that a tool that I want to go ahead and have in the toolbox. But my thing is like, I saw the video of like what you have to do in Photoshop and that sort of thing oh, yeah. with some of that. And <clears throat> while I, I love all that, it's not, not necessarily a skill set that I have. But you lay it out so well. And so I want you to take just a little bit of time to talk about what is the OMP Digital Designer? What can you expect 
out of your learning platform. Talk about some costs and such. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So ONP Digital Designer is an academy that I'm producing. I'm as a result of my work with a select pay clients that I'm working with. So I'm working with several clinics and, and practitioners in 3D and I'm producing video content for them. You know, that's how this all started because a, a, most of my job in 3D printing and ONP involved a lot of education up front. People were interested. People wanted to learn. There isn't an educational resource for doing the things that I do. You know, can you turn around and teach my clinic or teach my staff how to do this? So it very quickly turned into, oh my God, everyone needs a beginner's course in Fusion 360. Everyone needs a beginner course in ZBrush. I'm just going to spend the time and write that course. And so I have an academy up and I have two courses released right now. The, they're beginner uh, foundational courses in how to use Fusion 360 in ONP applications and how to use ZBrush in ONP applications. They're both uh, $300 right now, and they're ABC certified as well. So I spent the time and got to know them and th got them to take a look at the content. So it is accredited. You get, I think, almost four and a half, if not five credits, science credits, and almost one business credit for each of them, should you choose to take it. They're about five hours in length, each of them, 15 videos, and they all come with a bunch of really applicable sample files and templates. So you you walk away with, at the end of the course, an understanding of these two softwares and template files that you can reuse and recycle in your workflows between patients. And so the goal for these beginners courses is to establish sort of the baseline literacy rate for these two programs. And then over the next year, I'm going to be sort of outsourcing, uh, democratizing all of the skills that I'm learning through my experience with the clinicians I work with. I'm going to be releasing everything I know on this platform. And it's going to be by, by topic or by device or by software. And uh, we're going to do deep dives using these two softwares and how to, you know, go through the full process of texturing a cover or how to create automation or how to you know, take a reverse engineer scan. That's a big one I'm working on right now, you know, scanning hardware, scanning someone's sound side limb and device side limb, and then marrying those two together and then creating templates of different parts that can just adapt to those shapes and, you know, create uh, cycle times that, you know, could be as little as 20 minutes, 15 minutes to get you to a device or 3D printing. So all these concepts are like sort of introduced in the foundational series and are going to be greatly expanded upon moving forward. Well, and I, lo I love that. And, you know, I can honestly say that I definitely picked up a few tips. The workflow, I love seeing really how far Fusion 360 has come as well in the mesh ma manipulation stuff. And I found a lot of value in that. And I think our listeners would find a lot of value in it too. And one thing that I think that you've done that's very, very generous is not only for this podcast, but it sounds like for the rest of December, using a promo code, which you'll give here shortly, it will also give back to uh, Life Enabled, which is a nonprofit that is looking to create accessibility for prosthetics worldwide through digital technology. So I'd love for you to share just a little bit about that promo that you've got going. Yeah. So until the, until the end of 2022 or to, until 2023, if you buy any of the courses on my store, there's a promo code, you know, life enabled 10 to receive 10% off of any of the courses. And then a portion of your purchase will also go towards Brent's, Brent's work with his, his charity life enabled. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Hey, thanks so much for, uh, for being on the show today. This was great. And I'm sure we'll have you back on as you add to your course and, and, and really what you're, what you're learning, because I think what you're doing and providing to the field for opportunity to get in with a really a low barrier to entry as far as a cost model is really great. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Yeah. And digital design literacy, I think like you have done a lot of work in this as well, sort of inspiring people and showing people where this can go if you take it upon yourself to learn these kinds of tools. So, you know, digital design literacy removes many barriers and it removes a lot of complexity. It removes the need to own a printer. It removes the need to, you know, spend thousands and thousands of dollars up front. It can get you into the game today. And if you do that, you today, you're going to be able to successfully navigate this coming transformation that's impending upon ONP.
Right. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here today, Arthur. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And Brent, thank you for being here, as always. <laughs> oh, it's been great. And uh, thank you for listening. My name is Joris Peels. We're here with Brent and Arthur today at the Procession North Orange podcast. Thanks a lot for being a part of it. Have a great day. Bye.